Jesus' name, and that's going to be an exciting day. It would be a great day for you to join in or some of your friends and family, some people you've been Bible studying with. That's two weeks from this Sunday. Now, we'll baptize you tonight if you want to be baptized tonight, but we're going to have a special effort to have a baptismal service two weeks from this Sunday, and somebody say amen. All right, uh, Genesis chapter 22. This is a culmination of a lifetime of preaching about the Holy Ghost. And I just like to simply title this little Bible study tonight. And this is, folks, I'm not smart. I'm not. I, I, but I've learned a lot. I've been preaching this for 26 years. And this is a little piece of everything I preached for 26 years about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I'd like to title this Bible lesson. I may not get through tonight, but I'd like to title it, What Shall We Do with Acts Chapter 2? That's my best poetry. Because the question I have, I, I sat with a denominational pastor yesterday for six hours, and we talked about Acts chapter 2. And at the end of the evening, I said, what are, we gonna, what are you going to do about it? I mean, you can't take it out. So what are we going to do about it? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to learn, and we're going to start in Genesis. Because if you're going to learn anything in the Bible, you need to start in Genesis. And we're going to start in Genesis, and we're going to end in Revelation, and we're going to figure out what we got to do with Acts chapter 2. Because you can't just take it out, and most denominations have. But I don't want to take it out, do you? I'm just glad there's no scripture in there about the highway department. Genesis chapter 22. <laughs> Pray for me, would you? Blessing, I will bless you. What is this? Does anybody know what this is? God's talking to Abraham, right? He said, Abraham, if you'll leave where you're at and you'll go where I tell you to go and do what I ask you to do, this is what I'll do for you. And this was a promise that he gave to the patriarch Abraham. He said, blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants and we talk about this a lot. As the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and if you've been coming here any time at all, you know what that represents. The spiritual and the physical seed of Abraham. We're the spiritual seed of Abraham. The Jews, the, the Hebrews, they're the physical seed of Abraham. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. And somebody ought to say amen about that. If you're a part of the spiritual seed of Abraham, you should possess the gate of your enemies. In your seed, Abraham, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. How many of you would like for your children to be blessed because you obeyed the voice of God? Couldn't we all do a little better job of obeying the voice of God? Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Keep your Bibles, phones, etc., handy. It's time, and I don't want to spend time on this, but it's time for everybody that hasn't been baptized in Jesus' name to get that job done. And we'll, we talked about it enough, and we'll talk about it all you want to. But Abraham, God told Abraham, in, in, in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, and, and I and I said this before, and I want to say it again for the sake of this Bible lesson tonight. If you were the Philistines or you were the Amalekites or you lived in Jericho, you weren't really blessed by Abraham's seed. If you lived in Jericho and your family got destroyed when the walls fell down, you couldn't say that I've been blessed because of Abraham. If you lived in Ai, you couldn't say, well, boy, I'm so thankful those Israelites are here because they just killed everybody. So when you talk about where do you find in the Scripture where the seed of Abraham caused everybody in the world to be blessed, what, somebody give me the name of somebody that was born that blessed the whole world and he was from the seed of Abraham. There's only one person that fits that description. Jesus was born from the seed of Abraham. And I'm going to tell you something. Every nation in the earth has been blessed because Jesus was born. He died. 
and he rose again. Let's finish the story. It's not just he born, he died, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he sent back his spirit to live in our hearts. That's the rest of the story. We talk about the death, burial, and the resurrection, but we don't talk about the day of Pentecost. Too many people are living on this side of Calvary, but on that side of the day of Pentecost. They're living in that 40-day gap. Most denominations in America are living in that gap, or the 50-day gap, excuse me. We, we, I want to live on this side of the upper room. Not that side. Are you with me? And some of you are going to be really challenged by some of this, so stay with me. If we don't dig through it all, we'll we'll finish it. But that means if you if I don't finish tonight, because sometimes I feel pain to finish because we don't always all come on Wednesday night, but that means you've got to come back next week. So so uh you could say that Jesus is where the blessing. The promise that he gave to Abraham, and these shall all. Can we put that scripture up again? Uh, the last one, uh, verse 18 of Genesis chapter 22. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. That was not fulfilled anywhere else in the scripture until Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. And the reason that Jesus was born in Bethlehem is because Abraham obeyed the voice of God. I'm so thankful that Abraham listened and he left Ur of the Chaldees and he went to a land that he didn't know. But what did God say? He said, you don't know where you're going. I'm going to tell you where to go. But he, uh, he said, if you'll go where I, you don't know where you're going, but if you'll go where I tell you to go, he said, everywhere you step, I'll give it to you. That's a pretty good promise. I love the Ozarks. I think if he told me that, I'd just start walking across. Cause I, I, I'd like to live there. You know, Abraham had to be walking across this. That's, a, that's mine. I want to hurry up and take that step because everything behind me belongs to me because God gave me a promise. Amen. And he was blessed. So let's talk about it some more. Joel chapter 2. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all the nations of the earth. I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. That's the first time that, that's the first time that was mentioned. All the nations of the earth, all flesh refers, all the nations of the earth would be all flesh, right? Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. We talked about that Sunday morning. Matthew chapter 3, verse number 11, just quickly running through some scriptures here. I indeed, who is talking here? No. John the Baptist, a resident Bible scholar up there, just completely blew that, didn't it? I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. John the Baptist said, he's a forerunner, right? But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you. I want you to leave that up there for a minute. With the Holy Spirit, the King James says, with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Jesus is not really a blessing to everybody in the world. Unless you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of people that know who he is. They know a lot of stories about him, but haven't been blessed by him. We're going to dig into that just a little bit. Acts chapter 1, verse number 4. And being assembled together with him, he commanded him not to depart from Jerusalem. Who's he? Who's doing the commanding here? Jesus but to wait for the promise of the Father. Somebody say the promise of the Father. What was the first promise? Abraham, in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. The promise of the Father in Acts chapter 1 is the same promise that he gave to Abraham in Genesis chapter 22. And I've spent a whole Bible lesson. I spent a lot of time talking about that tonight, but I need your credit on that just for a minute. The wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water. He's quoting what John just said. 
but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They thought he was, and they were still thinking about military conquest. And, and he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power. Doesn't matter whether Israel's restored or not, you're going to have power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end to every nation in the earth. This is not about Israel anymore. It was about Israel for a long time, but this is not about Israel anymore. This is about every nation in the earth. You're going to be a blessing, Abraham, to every nation in the earth. And in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth, to the very ends of the earth, every nation of the earth is going to be blessed. This message, this Holy Ghost message, put it back up there again, verse 8. Go back to verse 7. I, you got to get the logic. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times of the season. They'd ask about Israel. He said, not for you to know when we're going to store Israel. That's really not what I'm talking about. That'll happen when I say it's going to happen. But, verse number 8, but you're going to have power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you're going to be witnesses not just in Jerusalem, not just in Judea, not just in Israel, but you're going to be a witness in Samaria, and you're going to be a witness all over the earth. This is not just about Israel. This is going to travel throughout the whole whole world. You shall receive what? Dunamis is the original Greek word. You shall receive power. Dynamite. That's where the word dynamite came from. You're going to be explosive after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. All of us could be a little bit more explosive, couldn't we? Then Acts chapter 2, it hadn't happened yet. By the way, it hadn't happened yet. Don't do it yet. It hadn't happened yet. He's just telling them it's going to happen. He promised Abraham in Genesis chapter 22 it's going to happen. Then then, then John said it's going to happen. John the Baptist says, it's going to happen. I'm baptizing you with water, but there's one coming after me. I can't even latch his shoes. I can't, I'm not worthy to tie his shoes. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. But it hadn't happened yet. Then Jesus came, and he was crucified. He was buried. He rose again. It still hadn't happened. He lived on the earth for about 40 days. About 500 people saw him, and he was ascended into heaven. It's about to ascend into heaven. He said, now you go, Terry, in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. And it still hadn't happened yet. Then Acts chapter 2 is when it happened. Acts chapter 2, Tim. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all of one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting there, appeared in them cloven tongues, like as a fire set upon each of them. And what happened? They were all filled with the Holy First time it ever happened. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And what are you going to do about that? The world, the Christian world, don't want to do anything about that. They want to set that aside. Act like it didn't happen. Act like it's not there. You can turn on the television and all the Christian channels. You can turn on the radio listen to Christian preachers all day long. I didn't hear, I hadn't, I, I listened to them all the time. I listened to them, I drove from Houston today. I listened to preachers all day long. I never heard one of them. Talk about Acts chapter 2. But I'll say this, and I mean it, and I think I can prove it. It, Everything else is a waste of time if we take Acts chapter 2 out. So let's talk about it. Now let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse number 37. After it happened in Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, Peter preached this beautiful sermon about what had just happened and told them this was the promise of the Father and all these were wonderful things that had just happened to them. And, and, and he told them that they had crucified the, the Messiah that had came to give them this Holy Ghost. It's a beautiful sermon. You should read it. And when they heard what Peter said, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Don't change the scriptures yet. What shall we do? And I'm going to submit to you that that was the first time in the New Testament That's a salvation question. I don't think I would do any damage to the text 
to say this, men and brethren, how can we be saved from this terrible thing we've just done? What shall we do? We just crucified the Messiah. What can we do? What shall we do? It's a salvation question to me. Men and brethren, how can I save myself from what I just did? How many of you, and I th- every one of us, and I, could we be honest with ourselves, and we all need to be saved from something we've done. Then Peter said unto them, how come Peter said it? It's a whole different lesson I taught a few weeks ago. How come Peter said it? He was the only one who could. Why? He had the keys to the kingdom. Jesus didn't even say it because he had given Peter the keys. John couldn't have said it. His best friend couldn't have said it. John the Baptist couldn't have said it. John the Revelator couldn't have said it. Even Jesus himself couldn't have said it because he had given Peter the keys. What shall we do? And the man with the keys, he opened the door to the kingdom of heaven. And I'll prove it to you in just a second. He said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children and all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Every nation of the earth. Repent and be baptized. How many of you? Every one of you. So you see, you see the importance of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to say this to you, and this is where I'm going to challenge you. Most denominations go so far as to preach against the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Not just to ignore it, but they go so far as to preach against it. But I'm going to tell you something, and this is where I want to challenge you. I'm not 99% right. I'm 100% right. It is the reason that Jesus came to the earth. He came to the earth to fill his people with the Holy Ghost. Well, I don't know if I believe that or not. Well, you're going to in just a minute. Got your Bible. Let's go. Remember, we talked about it. We've we've laid a pretty good foundation. We talked about the Bible being a book of progressive revelation. In the Old Testament, it it was God for us. And then in the New Testament, in the Gospels, it was God with us. Well, I don't know about that. Well, let's read it. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. But then he didn't stay, he left. Colossians 1.27 says what? To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, What is the riches of the glory of this mystery? Christ in you, for us, with us, in us. A progressive revelation. Would you say that in you is better than for you? Did we say that in you is better than with you? Christ is not for us. He's not with us. He's in us. And then the next step is the glorified step that's going to happen one of these days when we're going to be like him. We're going to be joint heirs with him. We will be just like him. We will see him face to face. But we're in that third step of this four-step progressive revelation. Adam was able to look on the face of Jesus Christ because he was eternal like him. And we're going to get back there one of the days. But right now, we got Christ. We can have Christ living in our heart. Okay, well, I still don't know if I believe you or not that that's the reason he came. That he, he, he came to shed his blood so we could be, our sins could be forgiven. I, I agree with that. But he, he, he resurrected himself from the dead, and he could have just hung around for a few thousand years. It had been fine if that was what it was about. But that wasn't what it was about. Go to John chapter 14 or 16, I think, verse 7. Is that right, Tim? Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage. Everybody says it's to my advantage that he went away. What's the advantage that he went away? They wanted him to stay. 
For if I don't go away, the Holy Ghost can't come to you. The helper can't come. But if I depart, I'm going to send him to you. It's better for you to have me in you than me with you. The whole reason that he came was so that he could be in us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Are you with me? John 14, verse 26, talk about the helper. The helper, because you didn't go back to that. Go back to John 16, 7, because some of you, he said, for if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. Well, who's the helper? Because some of you are asking that question. Well, let's go to John 14, 26. But the helper, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. There's only one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's why we baptize in Jesus' name around here. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things I said to you. What's, who is the helper? What's the helper? It's the Holy Ghost. What's the Holy Ghost? It's the spirit of the, what's the ghost? The ghost is the spirit of one past. It's the spirit of Jesus Christ living in our heart. We don't need to pluralize that or make that difficult. That's just Jesus in our heart. So I just proved to you, if you got one eye and half sense, that the reason Jesus came to the earth was to baptize his people in the Holy Ghost. I got one amen. That was from my dad. Can I get another amen? That crystal amen. So, what is the Holy Ghost? It is Jesus Christ living in your heart. That's what it is. Just proved it. And so, having said that, let me say this. We have a thousand religions in America. In this room, we have a lot of different opinions, a lot of different religious ideas. When you're entitled to your ideas, you have a right to be wrong. <laughs> but religion won't do it. Just ask the Jews. They were the most religious people in the world. If religion would do it, we got mamas strapping bombs to their 15-year-old boys and walking them in shopping malls and blowing. That's religious, honey. That's commitment. We have trouble getting a few folks to show up on Wednesday night. Maybe we could be a little bit more religious. I don't know, but religion won't save you. But Christ in you, if the same spirit dwells in you that dwelled in him bodily, when the trumpet sounds, that's what's going to get you out of here. That's a whole other lesson for another day. But what we need in this last hour, in this end of this age, is a revival of Holy Ghost and fire baptism. We need folks receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost in our church services on a regular basis. That's what we need. That will change the world. Good preaching won't change the world. Pretty singing won't change the world. We're going to sing better and we're going to preach better. We've got a commitment to it. We're going to do better, 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 better. In every area we're going to do better. But it doesn't matter how good we do, it ain't going to get the job done. Because religion... Good preaching, better preaching, or better singing, that's just more religion. That's not going to get the job done in the long run. It may inspire somebody to, to come to the altar, which is all we're trying to do. But when you come to the altar and your spirit touches his spirit, and he, you evacuate your heart by repentance, and you empty that filth out of your heart, and his spirit comes back to live in your heart, that's what we're after. We need some... Holy Ghost witnessing. We need some Holy Ghost healing. We need some Holy Ghost delivering. We need some Holy Ghost fire. We need some Holy Ghost power, some Holy Ghost every nation of the earth. We need some Holy Ghost around here. That's what we need. That's what I need because it's the only. I, I know me and I know how stupid I am. And the only thing that's going to change me is a 
fire, a, a baptism of Holy Ghost fire. And I know you. And although you're not as stupid as I am, you have a tendency to do dumb stuff occasionally. The only thing that's going to fix you, the only thing that's going to fix me, the only thing that's going to fix us, we get fixated on all sorts of things. Man, I went to the gym. I, I drove in from Houston today, and I, I went to the gym, and I was in there just hurting myself. Like how I got, I realized that I got arthritis in this shoulder, and this knee swole up about three times the size of the other one. I'm like, you know, this is pretty frustrating. Because one of these days, this old flesh I live in is just going to rot. But the spirit inside of me is going to live forever. I'm spending a lot more time trying to lose five pounds than I am trying to get full of the Spirit. Nothing wrong with that, but God help us. Acts chapter 10. If you're with me so far, say amen. Well, Peter was, again, Peter was the first one to preach to the Gentiles. Why? Because he had to because he had the keys to the kingdom. So Peter was in the household of Cornelius, and he was preaching to him about the Holy Ghost. And while he was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision, that's the Jewish folks, the Hebrew folks, who believed there were some Hebrew Christians there, and they, they had come with Peter, and they were astonished. Why were they astonished? Because these Gentiles hadn't been circumcised. They weren't Hebrews. They didn't keep the law. These were Gentiles. These were Romans. They were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, and this is only the only example in the Bible where someone received the Holy Ghost on credit before they were baptized. Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Verse 48, and he commanded them to be baptized. He didn't say, if you feel like it, if you want to, or it'd be a good idea if you did. No, he said, hey, go get the robe on. We're fixing to baptize you in the name of the Lord. And so they liked what he said so much they had him stay for a while. The Bible says that we cannot, and I, I don't know why, he said he chose the foolishness of preaching to save those that believe. And I don't know why he picked that particular deal, and I have never met a preacher who was worthy. But you need a preacher to tell you about the Holy Ghost, and that's my job here tonight. Now, once you get it, what does it do? People say, well, get the Holy Ghost, you speak in tongues. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not, that, that's an that's a initial outward sign. What, what does it do? What are, the, what are the, the, the Bible calls it the fruit of the Spirit. It, we used to sing that song, old song, give me that old time religion. Makes me love everybody. Okay. See if these things out, scribbled down. What the Holy Ghost does to us is it makes us love and magnify and glorify God. It makes us love his word. And I was thinking about that. I used to, I used to be carnivorous. I've been doing this long enough now. I can I can write a sermon. I, I I've been doing it long enough. I can't. I, we had a meeting in in my office a while ago, and I I said, you know what? I, I I'm I, I'm not. I don't, I'm not a talented preacher, but I've just been doing it a long time. And you can kind of give me a subject, and I can find a scripture, and I can come up with some examples. I can preach a sermon. Now, and I had somebody send me a text message the other day asking about being called to preach. I said, we've all been called to minister. 
preaching in a pulpit, it takes years and years of practice. I pulled out 20-some-odd Easter sermons that I preached over the years, and I looked at some of those sermons, and I thought, oh, my goodness, people actually listen to that garbage. It was horrible. But over years and years and years of practice, you kind of learn. I mean, if you, if you know, whatever you do on your job, you, I mean, if you play the guitar every day, you, you kind of learn to play the guitar. Preaching the sermon is just like playing the guitar. You eventually learn how, how to do it. But that's not ministering. I remember I used to say, I got, still got stacks. I got drawers full of stacked up legal pads. And I just said, and I didn't believe anything anybody said. I wanted to know it for myself. And I went through the scripture one verse at a time. And I filled those legal pads. I still got them. I just filled them with notes. I've spent years, I've spent two and a half years studying the end time, going through all, every scripture, everybody, the word. And I still got those legal pads. And I was hungry for the word. I'm not as hungry as I used to be for the word. You know why? Because we, you know what makes us hungry for the word? The Holy Ghost makes us hungry for the word. Let's get baptized in the Holy Ghost again, and we'll get hungry for the word again. It makes us love the word. It makes us love God. It makes us magnify God. It makes us glorify God. That's what the Holy Ghost does. You don't even know how to praise him. You don't even really know what to say until the Holy Ghost speaks through you. You can't even understand the Word. The Bible says that we cannot understand the Word until the Holy Ghost discerns it for us and tells us what it means. That's why we got so many different opinions. we got millions of preachers out there that aren't baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so God, but yeah, well, we don't have to disagree about the Word if we're all baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost makes you love everybody. It makes you love other people, not just you and your four no more, but it makes you love them all. Man, I love Jack Stevens like my brother who lives thousands of miles away in Africa. The Holy Ghost lets me love him like that. I stand at the door. That's one thing the Holy Ghost has done for me. I don't have all this down. I do as I say, not as I do here. But one thing I do, I stand at the back door, at the front door of the church. Just God, just one more person. Just one more person. I don't care what they look like. I don't care where they came from. I don't care what color they are. I don't care what, I, I don't care if they're homosexual. I don't care if they're, I don't care. Just one more person. Just come on, let one more person come to church. Because God gave me a love for people. You know what happened? I started a home mission church and nobody came. The first Sunday we had 35 people from the church about 20 miles away. They came and helped us worship. The next service it was just me and my wife and my son. And Jordan was like three months old. Nobody showed up. And I remember we had a little platform that wasn't as big as this. And a little bitty metal lectern that leaned over to the side and I laid down and I bawled like a baby because nobody came. I'd, I'd knocked on doors. I'd hung flyers. I scrawled. I was 27 years old and too stupid to know anything but I cried like a baby. And I showed up the next week and nobody showed up. And I showed up the next week and nobody showed up. But on the fourth week I was standing at the door and here comes this man and he came to church, and there was four of us. And he was Jehovah's Witness. And I, he came, and I just, and, and for like three or four weeks, it was just us and the Jehovah's Witness guy. But you know what? I got to feeling all spiritual and super pastoral. I mean, I had somebody. I was pastor. So I thought I'd straighten that dude out. And so he'd been coming about a month or a month and a half, and I stood in the pulpit, and I straightened him out, and he never came back again. Guess what? The next week, it, was, it wasn't anybody there. And I laid on that platform, I bawled again, and I said, God, if you just let one more person walk through that door, I won't do that again. got to be careful when somebody walks in the door we got to love them no I want to straighten them out I want to make them believe right there but first off we got to love them 
And the Holy Ghost will give you love for everybody. I got the door slammed behind me on death row. That's a weird place to be. You don't, may not know it, but right up here on this hill, uh, they keep teenage murderers in there. And I've been in there where they like, and I, the, the guards say, when you go down in that room, you're on your own. You have to sign off and you go down that room. And I, I sat in a room full of six young men and they all killed somebody. And they said, that one over there, he'd eat you with a knife and a fork if he could. And you could tell by looking at him. He wasn't kidding. But, you know, I sat in that room, and I'm like, Lord, just give me a love for these guys. And I sat in that room, and I just bawled. God, give us a love. Because if we love people, God, help us love more today than we've ever loved before. Because if we love people, we'll go out of our way to please them. And when we start pleasing and loving people, then they'll want to know the God that we know. And the Holy Ghost will help you turn from sin. You repent of your sin don't necessarily mean that you you turn around. It doesn't necessarily mean you can resist it. But when the Holy Ghost comes, when you repent of that sin and the Holy Ghost comes, then it gives you the ability to resist. You get frustrated because you're always going back to the same vomit. If you're like that dog that returns to his vomit, the Holy Ghost will let you walk away from the vomit. I don't know about you, but it sounds to me like we need a Holy Ghost revival. Some of us are praying for deliverance. Some of us are praying for strength. Some of us are praying for wisdom. Some of us are praying for healing. Some of us are praying to be used by God. But you hear me, we're all wrong. What we really need to be praying for, we need to be repenting, we need to be being baptized in his name, and we need to be filled with his spirit. Because when you're filled with his spirit, you won't have to pray for deliverance. Because if that spirit's in you, you're delivered, honey. Praying for victory. He was victorious over death in the grave. That spirit lives in you, honey. You got victory. Been praying for wisdom. When the God of the universe is enthroned in your heart, he'll give you wisdom. So what we ought to be praying for is the Holy Ghost because that's all of those things are included in that. Well, we got nine out of nine and a half denominations and churches down the street preaching against the Holy Ghost. So they're preaching against wisdom. So they're preaching against deliverance. So they're preaching against healing. So no wonder church becomes a cesspool. No wonder board meetings turn into fist fights. We need some Holy Ghost. I didn't get a single amen on that. But I long for the day, and I should have preached this on Sunday, and I may just do it again. But I long for the day, and I dreamed about it since I was a little boy. When five or ten or fifty or a hundred people would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit in one service. But that won't happen until the preacher gets right. And that won't happen until you get right. Because when the 120 were all filled, then 3,000 more came in, and then 5,000, and then daily such as should be saved. But you had to start with your core group first. They had to repent. They had to get right. Human reasoning is not the Holy Ghost. Psychology is not the Holy Ghost. Philosophy is not the Holy Ghost. Human reasoning cannot fix what's wrong with you. Psychology cannot fix what's wrong with you. Philosophy cannot fix. They might explain to you what's wrong with you, but that's even more miserable to know what's wrong and not be able to fix it. I'd rather not know what's wrong with me. I'm just crazy and I can't help it. 
You tell me why I'm crazy. I, 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 that just makes it. I, now I know why I'm crazy, and I still can't fix it. My God, that's good preaching. But the Holy Ghost, what I need, you need, what we all need is a refreshing baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. What about believers? The scripture says you believe in one God, you're doing pretty good. Until he finishes the scripture and he said, Thou believest in one God, thou doest well. The devil also believes and trembles. The devil believes in one God. <laughs> so you and the devil, y'all got gar on a roll. Let's talk about believers. Acts chapter 19, I'll finish. It happened. Can I go for about two more minutes here? I should have finished five minutes ago. I'm sorry. It happened while Paulus was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, disciples, followers, believers, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? I've heard a lot of people say, well, I'm a believer. I don't need the Holy Spirit. Nine out of nine and a half churches up and down the road said, I'm a believe we're believers. It didn't make Paul any difference whether they believers or not. He said, Did you receive the Holy Spirit? When you believed. He said, No, we didn't even heard about it. If there is a Holy Spirit. He said, Under the why then were you baptized? And they sent unto John's baptism. He said, John just baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying that the people they should believe on him who would come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And in verse number six, and when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Believers. I'm going to submit this to you for your consideration based on the Scripture. Just believing is not enough. Believers need to be filled with the Spirit because the reason Jesus came to the earth was to fill us with His Spirit. And if we get an old-fashioned, the two greatest revivals I know about, there's probably some in the world that history doesn't record, but the revival in the first century and the revival, the revival in the first 50 years of the 20th century were revivals of Holy Ghost baptisms. That's what we need. That's what we need. So let's just have it. Yes, sir. What he said, he said, the greatest deception, let's all stand together. He said, the greatest deception that the church has ever been told is that instead of us receiving the Holy Ghost, that when you believe that you've received, that, you, that you're saved, well, the devil believes and he's not saved. So let's be filled because that's the reason he came. And let me set this aside. I'm never going to argue with somebody. I'm never going to argue because I'm, I'm, I love people and I don't want to run anybody. I'm not going to argue about anything if I can help it. But if I can convince you that having the Holy Ghost is better than not having it, if Jesus died to give it to you, then why wouldn't you want it? And not try to not try to argue the point that you, you, bless God you're going to hell and you're going to split hell wide because you don't know because you're not God. If you tell somebody you're going to hell, that that raises the probability that you are. So let's preach the truth. Be instant. Let's be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. Let's love people and let's teach them about the Holy Ghost because if they ever get it, their lives will be changed. It's worth it. It's worth whatever we got to do. Amen. Well, yes, sir.
Have you ever felt it, Wayne? Have you ever felt that way and then you feel that I'm not where I used to be? I'm not where. And that, that this, the Holy Ghost can leave just like it came. If we don't stay repentant, Paul said, I die every day. I'm repenting every day. And that's what Dad's talking about. He's going to suggest things to us. And if we don't listen, that, that spirit will depart from us. I, I, we got, and that's what's happened to me many times in my life. That's happened to all of us at, at times in our life. We've got to be honest with ourselves. We've got to be honest seekers what we need right now and what we need every Sunday and every Wednesday and every Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday is we need a baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's what we need. If we get that, we'll be all right. Amen. And we need to stay humble and repentant. Let's, let's pray and let's ask the Lord to help us. Lord, I... I can't make it, I can't walk, I can't talk, I can't breathe, I can't do anything. I am such a failure without you. Let me ask you one more time. Forgive us and fill us. And if you'll do that, we'll be we'll we'll walk and we'll witness. And if you'll give us that power to overcome, we'll walk in it. Baptize your people, Lord, and help us to believe in it again. Help us to believe in it again and to walk in it again. And to Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And make this Sunday a Holy Ghost Sunday. And let's make this Wednesday. Would you just lift your hands to him and say, Lord, if it's real, I visit me with it, fill me with it. Search me, O oh Lord, see if there's a wicked way. Make me what you want me to be. Help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. Help me. Help me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Let me say this, and I need to shut up. But we lost our confidence because some preacher did something wrong or somebody, some Sunday. You got to set yourself aside from that and say, if the Holy Ghost is real, I want it. Set everything else aside. If the Holy Ghost is real, I want it. And I'm going to promise you he died to give it to you, and you'll get it. Brother Johnson, you have the offering back. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Let's give the Lord a big hand clap of praise, and let's let him know we love him. Please give as you leave, and we'll see you on Sunday.